Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. Uh, it's a treat and a pleasure to be gathered together in the house of the Lord and to celebrate his love and grace. Uh, a few announcements to start with. Uh, if you look over to your right, my left, uh, the compassion table is set up, so I do encourage you to take a look after service to um, the different offerings there and speak with Danielle about uh, compassion. She's going to come up in a few minutes uh, and share with us as well. It's a great opportunity for us to really help uh, some children in need around the world, especially during this time as the needs are rising greater um, greater and greater each day, reality. Uh, along the children's ministry line, we do have Awana coming up on the 30th. We have uh, Foundation Youth Ministry starting up on the 23rd. And we do have Sunday School uh, resumed last week, it's downstairs second service. So a great blessing to be able to... Uh, work with the kids that way. And so pray for those ministries and pray for leaders. We could use some leaders in all of those ministries. So if you would uh, have opportunity yourself or uh, know of any or just would be willing to pray that we have the leaders we need to make those a uh, time of blessing for the children. Uh, keep things moving. I'm just going to have us rise at this point and uh, I'm going to read from Psalm 86 as we prepare for worship. Psalm 86, it's, it's, it's largely a prayer a prayer for God's provision and grace and faithfulness in our lives is a prayer that we know is answered because he is faithful. He is good. And there's much reason to praise. It says, guard my life, for I'm faithful to you. Sir, save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me. Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. Lord, our, you, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call on you. Hear my prayer, Lord, and listen to my cry for mercy. Let us rejoice in a, the one who is faithful and good, who we can trust and cry out to in time of need.
God, you led your people out of the wilderness and performed miracles, parting the Red Sea, giving them manna in the desert. You've turned water into wine. You have let the blind see again. You have made the lame to walk. But truly the greatest miracle is the one that you perform in our hearts, in our rebellion and our selfishness and our stubbornness to soften us, bring us back to you. Thank you, God, for your mercy. We know and trust that you are for us. And if you are for us, who can ever stop us?
Amen. It's great to be in the house of the Lord today. Thank you so much for being here and for worshiping our God along with us. We welcome you to have a seat this time as we hear about compassion and the work they are doing with children around the world. There are 385 million children living in extreme poverty, and due to the recent pandemic, that number is rapidly growing. Why? Because parents can't go out to earn money and children are going hungry. Because access to clean water for hand washing is limited. Because people can't get access to the regular and necessary medical care. It's true. Children and families living in poverty are hit hardest by crises like this pandemic. This is difficult to hear. But before you tune out, I want to introduce you to Ketsia. My name is Ketsia. I am nine years old. I like drawing and playing with my sister. Ketsia's family lives in Nueva Prosperina one of the poorest and most dangerous neighborhoods in Guayaquil, Ecuador. Her parents are loving, but poverty is an oppressive force that robs her of her safety and threatens her very life. We came here because we had nowhere to live. I had nothing for our daughters. Safety and security of our home is a real challenge to get into the house. Someone can just knock the wall out and get in. It's really scary for us. There is extreme physical poverty, but what is not as easily seen is the spiritual and emotional poverty. We see a lot of families in need. Dysfunctional families, sexual abuse and prostitution, drug addiction. I pray every day for my family to have bread. I pray for God to take care of me and my family, especially for my uncle who is using drugs. At times, life in Nueva Prosperina seems hopeless. But then in the midst of darkness, a light breaks through. I'm very grateful my mom enrolled me in the Compassion Project. I learned a lot about God and the Bible. I know when I pray to God, he provides for my family. He's always watching over my family. The connection to the Compassion Project is a lifeline to children and their families. And amid a crisis, like a pandemic, it ensures that their family has everything they need to survive. Like food, healthcare, hygiene supplies, assistance with rent payments, and more. All of this is delivered by local church staff and a powerful reminder of the love of Christ. And the local church is not alone. They have the support of child sponsors who empower their ministry and speak words of hope into the lives of children in Nueva Prosperina. People like Candice, Ketsia's sponsor, who got to visit her in Ecuador a year ago. There was one really special photo that had their family photo and then our family photo. It was like already they put our families together. The church here has provided that safe place for them where they physically can get some of the things they need, like having a few meals a day. But more so than some of those physical needs are the relationship needs that they have. So it's important for them to have another voice that's saying, I got you. I love you, I'm praying for you. You are worthy and you're valuable and you can do it. And in partnership with the local church, Candace is actually speaking these words of truth into Ketsia's life and they're changing her future. When I grow up, I want to be a veterinarian because I love animals. Hope is a powerful thing. Will you remind one child in poverty to have hope? Will you release a child from poverty in Jesus' name? To sponsor a child today, text LOVE to 83393.
Good morning. My name is Danielle Debink, and through the generosity of my husband's work, um, I'm sorry, I'm emotional because this video was taken in Ecuador, and that's where one of our sponsored child lives. And her village is in the same village that our son, or our adopted Compassion sponsored San Diego lives. And to see true poverty is hard, especially after my husband and I were just blessed with a beautiful home that we don't deserve. And so it's hard for me to speak this morning because I live in a country with wealth and I was born to Christian parents who taught me about Jesus. So give me one moment to collect myself. You can start the slideshow. Last summer, I had the chance to go to Ecuador um, through the generosity of WVA, and I was able to visit my compassion child with my son, Benaya. Um, compassion is a wonderful Christian organization, and their foundation has three C's. And as soon as my PowerPoint comes up, the first C is that it's Christ-centered, Every child who's sponsored in Compassion has the opportunity to know Jesus Christ. The second C is the local church. All of Compassion's love is sponsored through local church people who know Christ themselves. And the third C is child focus, that Compassion's focus is only on the children, but the parents of the child benefit because they know their child is getting supported and getting meals, and getting help with school, and has a safe place to go. Um, when we were in Ecuador, we visited three different um, churches that sponsor compassion sites. And the best way I can describe it to you is that it's like an after-school daycare center. The children often come there three to four times a week. They'll receive a hot meal, a nutritious meal, which could be the only three nutritious meals they receive all week. Um, there's like a Sunday school room that's broken apart into ages where they're taught Christian songs, the same songs that we're teaching our kids in the States. They're given a Christian lesson. They're also taught about meeting their physical needs. Most children do not have running water in their home, so the concept of brushing their teeth and washing their hands is very difficult. So the Compassion site will teach about their physical needs. So again, the, it's church-based. It partners with local churches. It's the ideal way for compassion to serve children in Jesus' name. Next slide. They're child-focused. A church partner's focus on child development, spiritual, physical, academic development, and children are transformed by the hope and the promise of Jesus. Next. Um, when I was in Ecuador, we flew into the capital of Quito, which is a very wealthy city, just like our major cities in the States. But 70% of the rural population lives in poverty. One of five Ecuadorians under the age of 24 are unemployed. And when people are unemployed, they often resort to gangs and violence and drug use. Next slide. Um, the compassion sites are all at local churches. They provide academic health, help, healthy meals, medical care, Christ-centered education, and love. The kids usually visit these centers three to four times a week. Next slide. Um, the Compassion Survival Program is a program for moms and babies where the moms will be checked on twice a month and the babies will be checked on until they're able to be sponsored. Compassion starts sponsoring children at age one. Um, this is a mom, Evely, that I met with her sons, Donovan and Darian. Next slide. We were able to go to Evelie's home. Um, it had dirt floors and concrete walls and a tin roof. There was no running water in her home. They did have running water close outside their home. Evelie is not married. She has to work in the fields harvesting onions and garlic while the children stay with her elderly mother. Evelie only learns about $120 a month. That's my son, Benaya, with the boys. Next slide. Um, this is myself with Evelie and her mom. Um, her mom would like to be employed, but there's no jobs for her. And Evelie's dad died one year ago. Next slide. Um, this is the village of Carabuela, Ecuador. This is outside a church. The church serves 194 children. 
It's amazing, and the church basement is a huge kitchen, and it provides opportunity for local women to have something to do that gives them hope. They serve all the children. The kids know they have to wash their own plates and their own silverware, um, and it was amazing to see. I'm kneeling down there with my black coat and showing them pictures of my family. The kids are starving for attention because with unemployment, a lot of the people are alcoholics and they don't want the kids around them and they just let the kids run free. So the kids will go to anyone who will show them attention and the church is a perfect place to show them the love of Christ. Next slide. This is the view from outside the church. There's a lot of construction that is unfinished. Um, there's not much color. There's a lot of gray and brown. This is a three-sibling family. I'm in the middle. I'm standing next to a church worker, and then next to her is a girl named Ada. She's 13, and then her brother Gyro has the hat, black hat on, and then her youngest brother, Sesa, age eight. They all live with their aunt, Christina, and the reason why they live with their aunt is because their mom died. Their oldest sister, who I believe was 17, died, their father is an alcoholic and doesn't want to care for them, so asked his sister Christina to care for them. Next slide. This is Christina. She has the pink blouse on and the long black skirt. Um, you might recognize Faith and Regina Meyer. They were also on the trip with us. There's 11 people who live in Christina's home. They do not have a bathroom or running water in their home. Next slide. Um, Christina's husband can work on a plantation if there's good weather. Otherwise, Christina raises guinea pigs in her house and will sell them for meat. And so also whatever local crops she can sell from her front door. So when we were there, she had a whole wheelbarrow full of green peas and we helped her shell the peas. But work is inconsistent and not steady. This is the picture from outside their home where they hang their laundry and where the chickens run freely. Next slide. Um, this is our sponsor child, Diego. Um, he came with his dad, Alvin, and his compassion teacher, Marjorie. Marjorie, you could tell, just loved Diego. She's like his Sunday school teacher and his mom. Um, our prayer is that um, Diego's dad would come to accept Jesus and be part of the local church. Currently, when we visited with him, he wasn't. Um, we were able to find out this information because through every visit, you have a translator that's provided. Next slide. Um, Diego lives in Guayaquil, which you saw in the video is also where the little girl lived. He had to do a 10-hour bus ride in order to meet us in Atavalo, Ecuador. He traveled with his dad and teacher. The average monthly income in his town is only $180 a month. Um, Diego has one little brother um, and lives with both of his parents. Next slide. Compassion's goal is to reach children from poverty in Jesus' name. The opposite of poverty is opportunity. Um, and we're able, through sponsorship, to give kids an opportunity that their parents cannot provide for them. And so I'm asking you to think about if you could afford $40 a month to sponsor a child. Um, I'll have the table out this week and next week. And if you have any questions, I'll be there afterwards. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Charles. And I would hope that you would consider stopping to visit Danielle at the end of our service today. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you here. It's great to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, it's nice to see the sunshine. Please join with me as together we go in prayer to our loving Father. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful Sunday. We thank you that we can freely gather together in a place and glorify you. It's encouraging to see the number of people attending church here at Faith Chapel increasing. 
It's always good to be together in the house of the Lord. Lord, you are a good and loving Father, worthy of honor and of our praise. You are righteous and just. You provide everlasting peace and comfort to all who believe in you. You are faithful. Help us, Lord, to be faithful followers. Provide for us the strength and confidence to live as followers of Christ and to share the gospel message with others. Help us, Lord, to begin our, our daily, help us to begin daily and stay in your word often. Help us to pray often. And let us then apply the word that we live in our lives daily. Not just in each hour that we gather here at church, but rather every hour of every day. We know, Lord, that you are in control of all things, yet we also recognize that Satan is always working here in this world. Lots of hardship going on in our nation. Be with our neighbors and our friends. Be with those in our community, in our state, in our country, and around the world. Lord, please bring peace to this world. Help us to live in such a way that is pleasing to you and help us to encourage others. We, we thank you for keeping most of us safe during this pandemic that you have kept us virus free. Many of us know someone who has been directly affected by the virus. Lord, please bring them comfort and relief from any pain or suffering that they might be experiencing. Help us to conduct ourselves in such a way so as to remain healthy and safe. We thank you that the children in our community have recently gone back to school. Help our children, the teachers, all the support staff to have a safe, healthy, and productive school year. Lord, we ask you to be with all of our children, whether they be young or old. Be with them as they navigate things like school, work, relationships, marriages, and the many hurdles that life brings. Keep them safe, comfort them, and draw them near to you. We are all your children, and you have richly blessed us. You provide for us during times of need, and you comfort us during times of struggle. You are an awesome and amazing God. Lord, we are excited that soon our children will be starting up youth groups again here, and the Iwana program will be starting. We are so blessed to be able to provide Christian-based programs for them, and we thank you for the many volunteers who help to teach our children to serve you while also encouraging one another. We have several in our church family, Lord, who are still hurting. Some are battling illness, recent medical procedures. Others are struggling with financial hardship, depression, and loneliness. Bring them all comfort and peace and stability during these difficult times. Father, we live in a country that is privileged beyond measure, yet we still have much unrest in our nation. Please bring peace to our streets. Many people here are influenced by Satan. Help us to encourage people, those people to seek you, to turn to you, and to develop a relationship with you during these difficult times. You've asked us, Lord, to pray for our enemy. And at times, this is very, very difficult. This is a difficult thing to do. Lord, be with those who riot, cause damage to property, and want to bring harm to others. We pray that their hearts will be changed and that you will lead those people away from the evil one and bring them closer to you. Be with those out west that are experiencing the terrible fires. Protect them as many have lost so very much. Be with those who are fighting the fires. Please keep them safe as they work to serve others. Today, as Danielle discussed, is Compassion Sunday. Help us to give to and support others who are less fortunate than we are. Help us to show the love of Christ as we pray for and care for others around the world. Help us, Lord, to help them. We thank you, Lord, for always being there for us. Please give us the strength to do your will, to follow your commands, and to apply your truths. Your loving care is comforting and assuring. Help us to spread the love of Christ to others, for Christ commanded us to love one another. Lord, please be with all of our national, state, and local leaders as they go to lead our country. We ask your guidance and for your guidance for them, and we pray that your will will be done in the upcoming elections. 
Draw all of these candidates closer to you and help them to seek your guidance and direction. While these are troubling times for us, in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, your words tell us that we should not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, and with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Help us, Lord, to turn to you during these times of trouble and uncertainty. Help us to grow in relationship with you. And let these difficult times result in the strengthening of our dependence upon you. Let our Christian walk be obvious to others. And above all, Lord, we thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. And now, Lord, let us put all these many distractions of this world aside. Allow us to open our hearts and our minds for the message from Titus that Pastor Charles has prepared for us this morning. And Lord, we ask these things in your precious name. Amen. A few weeks ago, I learned the hard way that having an unsound part in one of my RC planes was a disaster waiting to happen. One of my best flying planes uses nylon bolts in a, in a, a bar that goes across to, to attach the wings to the fuselage. And I noticed several months before this that one of the nylon bolts, as I would tighten it, would tighten a little bit and then it would slip and it would loosen up again. And, and I would uh, move it around to see if it made a difference on which side it was on, and the same thing would happen on that side every time. Well, being impatient with this and not wanting to figure out how to fix this, I ignored the problem. And I told myself, ah, eh, it'll probably be all right. It's not a big deal. Well, it was all right for many flights over the summer, but one fateful day, as I was uh, practicing some, some spin moves and coming down, uh, trying to increase my, my aerobatic flying abilities. I was real high and coming down and spinning the plane, and the plane was spinning beautifully. And then I started to get this uncomfortable feeling that I wasn't in control of this plane any longer. And as I tried to figure out what is wrong, why is it not responding, I noticed that a wing was gently fluttering in the breeze far away from the rest of the plane that was chaotically spinning and hurtling towards the ground. And all I could do at that moment was say, it's going to be a great crash. And thwack, boom, balls of pieces flying everywhere. A battery was flown 10 feet away, which is pretty impressive because the batteries are buried pretty low inside the airplane. It was a fantastic crash right into the center of the runway that I fly on. It was gone. In fact, not only your, your hope when you crash an RC plane is, is that you can fix it. That was clearly not going to happen. But your other hope is you can salvage the parts. Well, unfortunately, I, could, I couldn't salvage the engine, which is an expensive part of these. In fact, it had broken the carburetor off. It had cracked the lower part of the engine, and it was a total loss. It was gone. This plane that I enjoyed flying and was and really having a great time with and sadly can't really be replaced because they don't make it anymore. And so I lost this beautiful, great flying and, and one of my becoming, that's not a word, one of my planes that was becoming one of my favorites because of one unsound bolt. And, and if I had listened to that voice in my head that kept telling me, hey, maybe you should fix this, there's a reason why they expect those to be tight, I'd probably still be enjoying that plane today and learning how to fly it even better and having a great time with it. And I tell this, this story this morning because just as an RC plane can fly wonderfully when all of its parts are sound and working correctly, so too our spiritual life can become all that God wants it to be when we know sound doctrine and we live godly lives as he has called us to live. And so this morning, we enter into a section of Titus where he is going to show us how sound doctrine impacts sound Christian living. There's a correlation between those. And so Paul, writing to Titus, who is this leader in the churches of Crete, who has this responsibility to raise up elders and to instruct them on how to train the churches, he wants them to understand that 
Titus, you need to teach sound doctrine because when we understand sound doctrine of who God is and what the gospel is and what he's called us to, it enables us to live out the lives that God has called us to live, to delight in him, to enjoy him, to love him, to know him, to grow in our relationship with him. And so Paul instructs Titus, and and we're going to look over the next several weeks about what does he say to men? What does he say to women? What does he say to slaves and servants about how to live as God has called us to live? Because we are to be transformed people in our character and in our actions. We are in this process as we read God's word and the Holy Spirit speaks that truth to us and guides us and convicts us and helps us to be transformed. I encourage you to turn with me in your Bibles to, uh, or your Bible apps to Titus 2. Titus 2. We're going to look at the first two verses and then verse 6 this morning. And what we're going to see here is Paul's instructions to Titus on what to teach. And we're going to focus on what is he teaching to older and younger men? What are some of the truths that Paul wants Titus, that God wants Titus to encourage and teach these older and younger men. Here's what he says, Titus 2, verse 1. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance. And then verse 6, similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. Paul begins this section of his letter to Titus, instructing Titus on the importance of teaching sound doctrine. Right out verse 1. Now he's contracting the false te- contrasting the false teaching uh, we looked at last week. And he says, you, Titus, need to teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach what it means to live as a follower of Jesus because you know the truth of who God is. At the end of Titus 1, Paul warned him about the dangers of false teachers and false doctrines and how it disrupted entire households in the Cretan church and it led people away from God and the life he wants us to lead. And so now Paul urges Titus to teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Paul wants Titus to teach, to instruct, to communicate to the church that our faith is built upon the gospel and that understanding of the gospel, the truth of God's word, leads to these godly lifestyle that he wants us to have. And so as Christians, we need to have clear teaching from God about what does it mean to live appropriately as his children, as his people, as his servants. So what is the sound doctrine that Paul wants Titus to teach? Well, we find a great summary of the core of this doctrine that Titus should teach at the end of chapter uh, 2 in Titus in verses 11 through 15. Here's what Paul writes to him. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. He's talking about Jesus and what he has done for us. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, right? We are to live a life that uh, mimics, that, that imitates, that looks like how Jesus led his life, a godly life that that denied worldly passions, that was self-controlled, upright, godly. Why are we doing this? Well, we're waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, right? Jesus is returning, and we're called to live for him now, to be in relationship, to expect to be with him forever, to tell others that good news that they might be with him. And what did Jesus do? Verse 14, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness, And to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These then are the things you should teach. So it's a great summary for Titus to say, these are the core truths. Teach what God's word says about who God is and what he's done and the person of Christ, how we have a relationship with God and how that then leads us to to follow what he thinks and says and does in this world. So we see that sound doctrine leads to sound living. And so let's look at the way older and younger men are to live their lives soundly as godly Christian men. Titus 2, verses 2 and 6 again. Teach older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance. And then similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. 
Paul begins by focusing on instructions for older men, right? In Titus 2, 2, he says, teach older men. Well, who is Paul talking about here when he refers to older men? Well, as I was studying this, generally this term used for older men uh, speaks about men between the ages of 40s and 60s. Now, I'm not quite sure what they call men above 60, maybe dead. I don't know what that is all about in their culture. Maybe there was another word that was used. I also like to think that the, uh, the category, I was looking at it, it, some of them were very specific numbers, like to 66, and, and one of them was like mid 40s. So since I am not ready to accept the mantle of older man, we are going to say older men are those who are 45 and older because I am not there yet. And I'm, I'm grateful. I'm, I'm almost there, but not there yet. So we're going to push that up a little bit out of my category, out of my range. But in their culture, what we're talking about here is men who lived in the, to their 40s through 60s, right? And above, obviously. But, but these are men who live long enough to have many life experiences, right? To, 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 to reveal and to show their conduct and their character. The reality is, the unfortunate and uncomfortable reality for us sometimes as we get older is that we start to realize, I have developed character patterns and thoughts and behaviors that are mine. They're kind of set. How I view the world and how I act and what I expect and what I do, right? Right? There's a reason why we have that phrase, you can't teach old dogs new tricks, right? That there's some truth to that, that, to that, uh, that image, right? But the good news is for those of us who are older men and for all of us is through the power of the Holy Spirit and the transformation of the gospel that comes when, when we as men, when we as people humble our hearts and we say, you know what, I want to know God. I want to love him more. I want to obey God. I, I, I want to become like him. Older men... Older folks can see progress in becoming more like Jesus and how we think and how we act. And as, I, as, as we think about this sermon this morning, for those of you who are like me, under 45, and are not older men yet, the opportunity here for us is to say, well, if Paul is encouraging, or, or God's word is encouraging us to have these character qualities, what do I need to be thinking about and doing and what does my spiritual life need to look like now so that when I do get 45 and older and I'm an old dude, I, I have these character qualities. I have this spiritual life within me. And the first character quality older men are to strive for is temperance. Verse two, teach older men to be temperate. What does he mean by the word temperate? Well, this word relates primarily to the use of alcohol. Crete, like most of Roman society, was, was very prone to alcohol consumption, to gluttony, to overconsumption of food, right? Uh, last week we saw the, 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 the phrase or the, the statement about them, they're evil brutes, liars, and gluttons, right? Roman culture was very known to enjoy, especially in the upper class and middle class, alcohol. They consumed it a lot. And so as Paul is writing Timothy, Titus, excuse me, to instruct Christian men, he says, listen, for a Christian man, especially an older man who comes to faith in Christ, it's really critical that you instruct them, listen, oh, abuse of alcohol is not appropriate for a Christian man. God's people are to be controlled by the Holy Spirit, not alcohol. And the sad reality is, is that alcoholics and their families know far too well the destructive power of abusing drink. They know how it keeps the alcoholic focused on getting drunk instead of living upstanding, godly, and productive life with the family in all areas of life. And the same is true for us today, that God expects and helps us through instructions like this and the Holy Spirit within and our church communities to avoid the abuse of alcohol and to help us find help from him and from the church family when alcoholism becomes an issue. We live in Wisconsin. This is a problem for us, right? I, I see those signs that say drink with Wisconsinably, and I think, what does that mean? I don't know if we should be saying that because we like our drink. We drink a lot. And, and some of us struggle or have given into or have found that alcohol becomes abused in our lives and becomes a problem. The good news is God can help. God can redeem. God can change our lives, our hearts, our minds, our thoughts on this. 
And so if you're struggling in that area, men here today, and women too, because Paul's going to refer this to women next week when we see, but we have great ministries in our church and community. Celebrate Recovery is a great resource for those who are struggling with alcohol use, abuse disorders, and Alcoholics Anonymous can be a very helpful group in finding God's grace and truth and turning away from drunkenness to sober, godly living. Paul starts and he says, listen, men, you need to be temperate. You need to recognize the danger of alcohol and not let it become controlling influence in your life. That's the job. That's the role. That's the beauty of the Holy Spirit within. Next, Paul says that older men are to be worthy of respect, worthy of respect. This word refers to the idea of living a life of good character, of being honorable, of worthy of the responsibilities and opportunities that one has, that God has given us. And the only way that an older man and a man in general can live worthy of respect is if he behaves and treats others and he goes through life's trials and triumphs in a way that others see and say, that man is handling life respectably. That man is handling life in a worthy way. And what that brings to mind as I thought of this is for the older man or anyone who comes to faith in Christ, it may me needing to admit that, hey, I have some beliefs, I have some behaviors that are not or were not according to God's will. I didn't treat my wife right. I didn't treat my kids right. I didn't do my business dealings correctly. And so there may be a a time for us as men, as we desire to be godly men and to follow the Lord, to say, I might need to make amends for some things in my life. I might need to seek some forgiveness for past wrongs and injustices that are done, that I have done and inflicted upon others. The, The story of Zacchaeus from the Gospel of Luke comes to mind as I was thinking about this idea of living a worthy life, right? He was a wealthy tax collector, And he gained his wealth by hurtful, unjust, and sinful ways. Luke 19 tells this story of how after he came to faith in Christ, his character was changed, which led him to make restitution to the wrongs he had done and those he had hurt. Here's the story. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was because he was short and could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him. And since Jesus was coming that way, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, Here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This is a great example to us of how a transformed heart leads to, to different or transform behavior. Zacchaeus, as he has this interaction with Jesus and, and, and he, Jesus comes to his house and he welcomes him, there's this moment when he realizes, I want to know Jesus. I want to be in relationship with God. I want to have this man be the one that I follow. And he realizes, wait, 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 what the life that Jesus is calling me to is very different, opposite, in fact, of the life that I have been leading. My life has been all about sinful selfishness and abusing others and getting rich on the backs of others and abusing the status that I have. And he says, you know what? I can't do that anymore as a man of God. That God has saved me. And so I need to be different. And so what is his difference? He focused specifically on his most egregious sin that impacted others. And so he made restitution. He paid back. He gave to the poor. He paid back the amounts of those he cheated. That's a great example to us of a man who did not leave a life worthy of respect. But when he became a follower of Jesus, he realized, I need to be different. Can you imagine now the stories that were told about Zacchaeus? 
the stories that were told about, we're not 100% sure who this Jesus guy is, but did you see what happened after he talked to Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus showed me the money. He brought it back. He gave me back four times what he had taken from me. Remember that? Yeah, that Zacchaeus, that guy that's the complete jerk and all of us hate. He, he made right and went beyond. He followed the law and what he was supposed to do. I'm, I'm shocked. Who did that? That Jesus guy. His life was transformed. He started to live a life that others would say is worthy of respect. What Zacchaeus did was commendable. It was honorable. And so men of our church, I ask you, how are we doing at living lives worthy of respect? Do we treat our wives as God says we should treat our wives? Do we treat our children as God says we should treat our children? Do we do our jobs in a way that others would say is honorable and that we are honest and truthful and respectful to others? Are we worshiping God regularly at church and fellowshipping with Christians so that we can encourage each other to mature in our faith and, and are we serving with the gifts that God has given us where there is need? If not, we need to say, well, am I living this life worthy of respect? And ask God to help us give up our sinful ways and, and turn from them so we can live as God has called us to do. I counseled a young man a little while ago who's in his 20s and was sort of just starting out in his professional career. And he had transferred into a part of the business that he thought he would really enjoy. It was more management and leadership and and what he found there was that some of the ways they did business was dishonest, that they manipulated the truth with some of their business affairs. And his bosses asked him directly to participate in some of this deception. And for his bosses, this was just how business was done. When he talked with them, they said, oh, it's not a big deal. It happens all the time. This is, it won't hurt anyone. It's, it's just a little lie on timetables. It'll be fine. No worries. Well, he was convicted as a Christian man that he should not be part of such deception and manipulation of these facts. And, and as we talked, it was clear what he needed to do. And so not long after those conversations about this, he requested and God was gracious and he received a transfer to another part of the company so that he would no longer be involved in, in such behavior directly. And as I thought about this young man and this decision he made, you know, from a personal place, it's a hard one for him because it was a job that he wanted to do. He thought that was the direction he wanted to head, and he realizes I can't do it because it's calling me to do things I can't do. And so there's a personal sense of loss, of advancement, and yet he said what's more important is being a man of integrity and honesty. It was also a difficult decision to do because it would be scary to go to your bosses and to say, especially after you've had conversations about the honesty of business dealings and say, I'd like to go back to where I was. But what's amazing about that is that he knew what was the right thing to do and he took the steps to make the right decision, trusting God with the outcome. And, and the other blessing of this is it certainly revealed his character to me, to his wife, to his family. And I'm sure that those who work with him value very much his honesty and how he desires to do his job with integrity. It's a great example to us men of, are we living lives worthy of respect? Are we trusting God with those things that are difficult? Are we loving our wives, our children? Are we serving our Lord. Paul also encourages older and younger men to be self-controlled. Look at Titus 2, 2, 6, and 7. Teach older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled. And really, the only instruction he gives here directly to young men is to be self-controlled. What is self-control? Well, self-control relates to the ability to curb or to control our desires and impulses and so that we live life in a measured and orderly way. It starts with having a sound and healthy mind that knows what is the best way to live and then having the ability, the wherewithal, the willpower, the strength to behave in a sensible manner. And so this character quality of self-control actually is brought up several times within this instructions to Christian people, to, to older men, to younger men, to women, to slaves. The reality is it is a fundamental 
spiritual reality, right? It is a fruit of the spirit and it's crucial for our ability to be temperate and to live lives that are worthy of respect. Because without self-control, we are driven by our passions, our desires and our wants that are often destructive to ourselves and others. And the reality is, is that even, even good things over-consumed because of lack of self-control can be destructive and detrimental to our lives. But with self-control, we can grow in our knowledge, in our love, in our obedience to God. We can order our lives and, and find peace and, and process things so much healthier and meaningfully in our lives. So having self-control is a fundamental spiritual and character quality. And the reality is that when we are self-controlled, we focus on what God wants us to focus on, and we make choices to do the things God wants us to do. We see this in Colossians 3, 1 through 2. Paul is writing to this church in Colossae, and he says, since then you have been raised with Christ... He's speaking about our relationship with God, that we have new life because of our faith in Christ, that we are God's children, his people, given new minds and new desires to follow his will. He says, since that's the reality of who you are, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your, thing, your mind on things above, not on earthly things, right? The word set your here that's used twice is an imperative command. Do this. Focus on this. Be intentional to say, I need to think about what does God want me to live like? I need to set my heart, my will, my desire on the things of God to, to look at Christ and what he's done and what he's called me to do. The great news of this is we don't have the ability to have self-control by sheer willpower on our own, but by the grace of God to help us. And those of us that know how difficult it is to have self-control are grateful that God is involved in that process because we do not have the ability of ourselves to do it. But when we trust in the Lord, when we set our minds, when we seek him, he enables us to choose and to act and to do to intentionally focus on and pay attention to God and his truth for our lives so that we can live according to it. And so if we think about the spiritual things we have in our lives, self-control leads us, it urges us it, to, to choose to study God's word, to know God's truth on how we are to live. Self-control leads us to, to choose to, to pray and to spend time with God, to go to him for our needs and our concerns, to thank him for the positive things in our life and to trust him and express our fears and anxieties and work through those when life is difficult. Self-control leads us to choose to go to church and worship and fellowship and service others. Self-control helps us to stay away from sinful thoughts and behaviors. Colossians 3, a little bit farther in that book, verse 5, shows us that we are to be intentional to put to death sinful thoughts and actions. He says, put to death, therefore, right? Be intentional. Put the, that's a powerful image, right? It's like the sword in these things. You want to kill them. You want to cut the heads off of these in our life. We want to be intentional to, to root them out and not allow them to have influence. And what are they? Whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And he lists some of these, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Self-control causes us, encourages us, leads us to say, no, 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 this stuff's got to be gone. I got to be intentional in getting rid of it. Self-control helps us if we come back to our text, avoid abusing alcohol and other illicit drugs that are destructive. Self-control leads us to choose to confess sin and seek God's help in repenting or turning from our sin. Self-control is commanded for everyone, men, women, slaves, why? Because it is an ongoing, constant need in our lives. Every day we have to exert self-control. And the more we practice this spiritual and character quality, the more our lives will be conformed to the thoughts and the behaviors of Jesus. Paul then goes on, I think in this text, to explain how is it possible for older men and younger men to be temperate and worthy of respect and self-controlled. And, and I think this is where he goes next. He says, it's possible the way that we as men 
can be temperate, worthy of self-respect and self-controls comes from the soundness of our faith, the soundness of our love, the soundness of our endurance. Look what he says, teach your older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith and love and endurance. What does sound mean here? Well, sound means healthy or of sound body, right? It refers to mental and physical health and well-being. When used figuratively as it is here, it means being doctrinally correct and being sound in teaching and instruction to know the truth. And so Paul says being sound in the faith means knowing the truth of the gospel and the truths of our faith so that we can know what is godly and how to live out our life. Paul speaks about this in Colossians 2, 6 through 7, encouraging them here to grow in their faith. He says, so then, just as you receive Christ Jesus our Lord as Lord, continue to live your lives in him rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. As Christians, what do we do? How did we receive Jesus Christ? We humbly come before him and we say, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I'm faulty. I know that I've rebelled against you. I know that I need your forgiveness and your righteousness to be made right. I know that I can only depend and trust on you for everything in this life. And I want to be your child, right? That's how we receive Jesus Christ in our lives, an openness, a willingness to hear the truth about ourselves and God and how we respond. And he says, that's the same thing you need to continue doing in your life of faith. If you do that, you'll be rooted in him, right? The, the roots will go deep into the faith, into the truth of who God is, into the truth of who we are. It will build us up. It will strengthen us in the faith, and we will overflow with thankfulness for what God is doing and will be a blessing to others in our lives. The imagery here of being rooted and grounded in our faith and built up in Jesus, it reminded me of Psalm 1. And Psalm 1 focuses us on the reality of God's word for a life of obedience. Look what he says. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or take a uh, uh, sinner's take or sit in the company of mockers. Right? This imagery here is one who kind of goes from kind of a peripheral, you're kind of does not walk in step, you're kind of hanging with them, and then all of a sudden you're getting a little bit more serious because you're, you're standing there, you're listening, you're buying into the false stuff of the world, of the wicked things and truth and false doctrines, and then you sort of sit down in the company of mockers, and mockers in the Old Testament, especially in this Psalms and Proverbs, are those who don't like God or open rebellion, who are not interested in the things of God, right? There is no blessing in that. Instead, the one who is blessed, the one who receives the fullness of life that God has for him, who's the one who delights in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. And he says, what is the result of that kind of life? That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. It's this beautiful image of, of a thriving tree, right? A fruit tree, I guess, or whatever. And it's by the stream. And why is that important? Because the stream gives it water and nourishment and, and, and I don't, all the other stuff that trees need to grow and bloom. And it keeps growing and it handles the rain and the winds and the times of dryness. And it produces its fruit. It's mature and it's healthy. It's a beautiful picture of what God wants to do in us which is to make us spiritually healthy, sound people who love him and know him and serve him and enjoy him and delight in him. And how does it come? Because we're dependent upon him. We root ourselves in Jesus. We root ourselves in his word, reading it regularly, applying it to our lives, asking God to change us. And the result is as we grow in our knowledge of Christianity and the truth of who God is given to us through the scriptures along with the gospel message and by striving to obey and live the good news and the godly lives that he's called us, we're going to grow in temperance and self-control and we'll be living lives that are worthy of respect. And so again, man, I ask you, what is our commitment level to being sound in our faith? What do our lives show about our willingness and our desire to know God's truth, to live out the gospel so that we can be godly men? 
Are we at least as concerned to grow in our knowledge of God and his word and develop our relationship with him as we are concerned about doing our jobs? For some of us, a great motivation. I want to advance. I want to do it well. I want to be the best engineer, teacher, whatever. Right? And I'm going to study all the time. and I'm going to move forward in my life. Do you at least have that kind of compassion for Jesus, for his truth? Do we at least want to know God and the truths of our faith as much as we want to know how to participate in our favorite hobby? I spend a lot of time tinkering with planes and reading things and watching videos and flying and cutting a grass field. Do I have that same passion or more at least for God and his truth and his word? Do we at least want to know God and the truths of our faith as much as we want to know about our favorite sports teams and our favorite league, right? I say this with great humility as today is the Packers' first game. But hey, are we as excited about Jesus? Are we excited about God? Are we desiring to know the truth and live for him as we are about that Packers game coming up in this season and talking about the leagues and the players and all the stuff? Do we at least want to know God and the truths of our faith as much as we want to know about video games and the latest superhero movies, right? I can talk with students and other adults who are into this stuff for hours about these things. Nothing wrong with any of this stuff, but the question is, does my passion for those things outweigh my passion and my commitment to pursue them and have them be part of my life outweigh my passion and desire to pursue God and who he is and the truth? Are we sound in faith or are we like my plane that, man, it looked great when I put the wings on and put the canopy on and I knew that bolt wasn't all the way tight, but I said, eh, it'll be fine. One little piece can't hurt me. Boom. Are we sound in our faith? Are we healthy? Are we desiring it? or many, many other things way, way above our priority level for it. He goes on to say, not only we sound in faith, but sound in love, and it means to know God, to love God and others, and it enables us to obey God and lovingly live and serve others, right? Love is the key here. It's the primary, most fundamental, healthy motivation for us to know God, to love him, and to serve him. And Paul talks about this in Philippians 1, 9, where he's praying for that church. He says, this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, right? What is he praying? Your love, right? Love for God, love for others may grow more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Why? So that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. What is Paul saying? I am praying, one of my primary prayers for you, fellow Christian, is that your love may abound more and more, that you may understand it more, that it may be deeper and more full in your understanding of who God is and how we are to love others. Why? Because that leads us to godly choices in living in our lives. I want you to understand, Christian, he's saying, that my prayer, that I, what I want God to do in your life is grow your love because then you'll grow in your fruit of righteousness and be pure and blameless. And part of that, if we go back to Titus, is being temperate and self-controlled and living that life worthy of respect. Being sound in endurance or pers- uh, being sound is also, Paul says, that we, are, we, we want, want to grow in our ability to be sound in endurance. And the idea is perseverance. It enables us to live godly lives through the ups and downs of life, right? We think about endurance, often our mind goes to physical endurance, right? That I'm amazed that like, I'm amazed at our Packers and the players that are gonna be on the field this week and the basketball teams that have been playing, right? The endurance they have, the athleticism they have is amazing. That they can play that long and that harsh of a sport, of football particularly, right? And, and how do they do that? Well, they exercise, they train, they lift weights, they eat right, right? Their life is, is focused on getting through the game and learning their body's rhythms and the challenges that'll come and staying healthy. And, and they, they do all the stuff they have to do so that their bodies can physically play the game through the good and the bad, the hardships, the difficulties, right? I mean, they suffer injuries. That, well, let's just be honest. If I fell down like any of those football players done, I'd be complaining for a week and want my wife to baby me, and I'd be popping aspirin and Tylenol forever, right? Because why? It would hurt like crazy. But those guys have bodies that are able to handle that. Why? Because they have trained themselves in endurance. 
And the same is true for our spiritual lives, that we build spiritual endurance. We continually, and what are we talking about here? The ability to love and obey and trust and find comfort and hope and strength in God. How do we have that endurance? Because we keep turning to the Lord and seeking him in our lives. Endurance means to just keep swimming, as Dory said. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, right? In Finding Nemo. There are going to be many challenges and difficulties we face due to living in a fallen world and having sinful passions and desires that we fight and wrestle against, but we're to keep swimming in the faith. How do we build this endurance? Spiritual endurance comes from humble prayer and reading and applying scripture and its truth to our life situations. Spiritual endurance comes from really worshiping God with his people so we remember his greatness and his character, his love, his truth, and his care for us. Spiritual endurance comes from fellowship with other Christians and using our spiritual gifts in service. And as we do these things, they help us to endure through the hardships and the challenges and the good things of life because all that we go through gives us opportunity to love and trust God more and obey him and go deeper into that faith that he has given us. Men, God wants us to be temperate, to be worthy of respect, to be self-controlled. And how do we gain these spiritual qualities? By being sound, by being healthy in our faith, in our love, and in our endurance. And so I leave you with this question, how are you doing in that? Praise God for the areas of your life where it's clear that God is working in you and there's spiritual maturity and godly character and beneficial service to others in life. Let's not overlook the reality that as Christian men, God is transforming and changing us and celebrate those and be grateful for those and to be thankful that we're men that are worthy of respect in many areas of our life and are temperate and and self-controlled, to praise God for that. Don't overlook that. Thank him for that. That thankfulness, that joy, that, that obvious work that he's doing will motivate us then for the second half of this, which is, well, in those areas where I'm not doing so great, to pray to God and to ask him to help you in those areas that you're stumbling and faltering and failing to mature and be the man that God wants you to be. And here's the thing. God already knows you're struggling, and he loves you. And he died to forgive those sins and to help you and be present in your life to encourage and strengthen you in that. And, and he's using the life situations and the uncomfortable convictions and the, the challenges and the consequences of actions and all the stuff that's going on. He's saying, listen, hear me, see me, my love, my desire to bless you by helping you conform more to my son, to live that sound life that I have for you. Because in that, we find peace and comfort and joy and hope and meaning and purpose. He's desperately wanting and willing and is working to help you become the man that he wants you to be. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord, we thank you for these words. Lord, we thank you for this picture, this image of what you have painted for us that we are to be as godly men men who are temperate, men who are worthy of respect, men who are self-controlled. Lord, we thank you for the many older men in our congregation who live this way, that are examples to us that we can look to and talk with and pray with and be encouraged by as we desire as younger men and as all men to grow in these areas in our lives. Lord, we thank you for the gift of life, the gift of long years to learn and to grow and mature and to have opportunities and experiences. And Lord, may we use all of those to draw closer to you, we pray. Father, we pray for self-control. That's hard. It's hard in our culture that, that glorifies and pushes and pressures us to instant gratification and to pleasure. Forgive us for the ways we fail. Help us to see the value of living orderly and measured in moderate lives in all things. We're grateful for your forgiveness when we fail and that you can strengthen and encourage us and help us and we can help each other in that journey. Lord, we're grateful for your word that teaches us how to live. May we love it, may we delight in it as the psalmist says. May it help us to be strong Christian men 
maturing and growing and rooted in you that we might be able to weather all the storms and understand and appreciate all the blessings of life, always giving you glory and praise. Eternal Father, you give us life despite our guilt and even add days and years to our lives in order to bring us wisdom. Make us love and obey you so that the works of our hands may always display what your hands have done until the day we gaze upon the beauty of your face. We pray these things in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I leave you with this benediction from 1 Corinthians. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next Sunday. Go Packers.